Okay, so the question was, can we do better? And yes, we can, but it's not very obvious why, why that's the case. So let's just recap what we did. Um, so first thing we did was we abstracted away the um, maximum number between two numbers, just two. Um, and then we created this function, uh, internal function, just to compute, to just to focus on computing the, um, the maximum number. Uh, but we also created this uh, internal uh, function definition just because we now are able to define um, a parameter called current maximum number, which we use to accumulate um, the maximum number before recursion. Um, we also created this uh, local variable definition just to cache the um, maximum number between two values from the first element of the list and the current maximum number. So that will, is the new maximum number. Um, and then the code becomes quite simple, quite small, as you can see here. Um, and we also isolated the, by creating this uh, function definition, we also isolated the case that, um, the exceptional case, right? The, the case where the input is invalid from the actual algorithm that we care about. And then what we saw was that we saw an, uh, an improvement of around five times faster, uh, meaning that, um, you know, for a million elements we had, um, we can go down from 100 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. And that is good, but it's not very clear why, why this um, code is faster. And to understand a bit better um, why, first we need to kind of see the two differences between attempt two and attempt three. And what we see is can be summarized in this um, in this slide. So in the attempt two, the one we did in our last lesson, uh, we first do the recursive call and then we accumulate we handle the accumulated results, right? We we recompute the maximum. And in attempt three what we do is first we recompute the maximum and then we do the recursive call. The recursive call is the, the last thing that is done. And that is very important because you can do the, this so-called tail call optimization. So why does it work? Why is it faster? To understand that, we have to introduce a bit of uh, the notions behind um, implementing Racket. You have to understand what is the call stack, and that is basically the stack that the runtime maintains to know what function to return to after um, a, a function call is performed. You also have to understand the notion of activation frame, which is basically just, you can think of it as a map from variables to values, and we'll implement this in our code. You also have to understand the notion of push and pop uh, from a stack, which obviously you know, but you also have to understand that before you call a function, you, you need to push a new activation frame that is going to be basically storing the local variables of that function call and then when and that you push over to the stack and then when the function call is done you pop the stack and you lose all that data because you don't need it anymore so here's an example with the classic factorial and what we see is uh, in the base case when n is 1 then we return 1 otherwise we compute n times the factorial and this is a, a version that is not tail call optimized and the reason is because factorial is not the last thing performed the last thing performed is the multiplication and let's see what happens uh, if you were to evaluate this step by step what you would see is on the left hand side the expression uh, and on the right hand side the call stack and what you see here is if you call factorial of three then the parameter uh, is assigned to 3 and what you're going to return is 3 times the recursive call of factorial of 2 and what that does so then you, you, you get this expression and then what that does is now you have to invoke evaluate factorial of 2 so you can think of this as the stack where you're pushing things on the right hand side and now when you're calling that what you have is the factorial of 1 uh, and you cannot, you know, you're still waiting for the result 
the result of the recursive call. So that's why I wrote this question mark here to just say I'm holding for the, I'm waiting for this value to be filled in. And it's filled in by whatever is returned by this um, activation frame. Uh, and then when I perform this recursive call, again, uh, you compute factorial of one. So it's two times whatever is returned by the factorial of one. And then in the, in the base case, you return one. So then you can go back and you pop, right? So you push whenever you do, you have a pending function call. And when the, the finally the, you reach the base case, you start popping. Um, so in this case, you return one and you fill this one, the return fills in the question mark. Now the return fills in the question mark and finally you get six, which is the result of this factorial of three, okay? So, um, with recursive code, what you will note is that, as you might imagine, it's very easy to have your stack grow and bound it. Um, and most functions, so this becomes a problem, right? Because at some point you won't have enough memory to store the computation of your code, of your recursive co code. So actually in, in the history of programming languages, recursive calls were very, uh, were a challenge and it was very important for programming languages back in the 70s to kind of understand how recursion works and implementing it properly because this whole idea of creating a stack frame in some languages this didn't even happen and what would happen what would uh, occur in practice would be that recursive calls would kind of mutate parameters and kind of mess up the state the internal state of the of the programming language so it, they would misbehave because they weren't, people didn't understand recursion that well in terms of implementing them in, in, functional pro in, progr in any programming language. So, but in functional programming language, recursion is crucial. It's the only way we have to compute. We have no loops. So how can you, how can you fix that? That's basically what we're seeing here, right? We have to have a solution to this problem. And what we see is that, um, you know, this factorial of a thousand uh, we compute, if you try to write this in Python, and this is a piece of Python, uh, you actually get a maximum recursion um, level. So non-functional programming languages, they just set a maximum number for your call stack. And if you ever reach that, you get an exception. So Python cannot even run this, but if you put it in, if you write this function in Racket, you'll see very quickly what's the result of that so why what's going on here um well one thing you can do to make it really fast and to make it tail call optimize is to use this trick where we have the accumulator uh, and we rewrite the factorial so that it uses the accumulator so let's see how the evaluation works so if you call the accumulator what you'll see is that the factorial of three becomes the same as factorial of three and you pass the three here so you the the this is the number that you're accumulating. Sorry, the second is the value that you're accumulating. So you initialize with one because you're going to do multiplication, multiple multiplications, and one is the neutral element of that. So you're using one to initialize the current accumulated value so far, and n to be the value that you want to do factorial of. Um, so factorial of three is the fact iter of three and one. And then what you do in each recursive call is you accumulate or store the current computation so far in the right-hand side. And uh, recursive calls make this element smaller. You always have to make something smaller so that you reach a base case eventually and, and your recursion stops. Um, so what we see here, factorial of three, two, one, then eventually you get six. So um, the point here is let's look at how evaluation works in terms of call stack. What you see here is that uh, calling the factorial of three, one, what it does is that the return value is just question mark. So it's the whole thing, right? And then if you do a recursive call of that, the return value, because you don't do anything, let's look at the code. There's nothing happening outside of the factorial. Factorial, the recursive call is the outermost computation. So nothing has to happen beforehand, right? So in terms of uh, the expression that we have to return to, once you do a function call of the recursive function call of fact iter, there's nothing else to do with that return value, right? So that's why it's just a single question mark. 
So when I perform each computation, as you see, as the computation unfolds, the return expression is always just a single question mark, right? And that's very important because it tells us that this is actually an opportunity for optimization. It tells us that we don't really need this call stack, right? Or rather, once you start doing recursive calls, you don't really need the, the previous uh, activation frame. You can replace it by the current one, right? Meaning that the only thing you do when you do a recursive call is you don't do push anymore. You could just replace the current call stack, right? And then whatever called fact iter eventually will just get the six. That's the basic idea, okay? It's just realizing that when you have uh, recursive function calls that don't do anything after the recursive call, you can optimize out the activation frame or the fact that you need to push and create a new one. You can instead reuse the existing um, activation frame, right? Basically this map that stores the local, local variables. So this means your, mem your algorithm is not growing in terms of memory. Right? So now you, you can bound your, your stack. It's not growing unboundedly. So what is the tail position and tail call? What is, it, what is this thing that we keep saying? So you've seen what it means and why the, the, op why the programming language runtime is able to optimize this. So now how do you identify code so that it, you know that it's tail call? Um, tail call optimizable. Right? So this is something transparent that happens behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. Well, the, the only thing you have to see is that the recursive call of a function has to be in the tail position. Right? So first, what is tail position? The tail position is in a body of a function declaration or a function definition. So usually you just have this in terms of function definitions, but you could have it in, in, in a function um, declaration as well. So but the basic idea, what I'm trying to say is that a tail position is the last expression, right? So you know that the body of a lambda has one or more terms. So the last term will be your tail position. It's the last position. And then what a, a, a function call is, it is uh, sorry, it's in the tail, it's called a tail call. If it's in the tail position, so it, it's the last element of um, the body of the function declaration slash definition is a function call. So if that's the case, if in the tail position there's a function call, that call is uh, called the tail call. So if the tail call is recursive, that means your code can be optimized by the tail call optimization. Okay? So essentially, this is what happens. So instead of growing the, the stack, you can just rewrite the stack. Right, and you don't push anymore because the programming language runtime is able to identify that it's within fact iter and it's doing a tail call recursive call to fact iter. So therefore, you can just rewrite or um, yeah, rewrite the current stack frame and not push anything. Um, yeah. So basically, in summary, what tail call optimization does is it. Um, avoids or avoids the need to have uh, to allocate an activation frame so it means that the the stack in that particular case the stack doesn't grow unbounded uh, and you can see speed ups um, and in our ex in our particular case there was a speed up of, of five times um, so it's it's an important thing and it's something that the compiler uh, or the programming language does behind the scenes for you but you have to know what is a tail call and that's something that will be assessed in this uh, second homework assignment. Um, okay, in the next video we're going to cover, um, we're going to revisit our user data structures and see what uh, features exist in the programming language to make that a bit cleaner. Okay.